API guidelines are something that a lot of organizations want to have because they are useful to help engineers to design and implement APIs better, but it's not so easy to actually create them and manage them. And today we have Esther Kunden of Google with us to talk a little bit about API guidelines and how it's done at Google. So Esther, thanks a lot for joining. And can you introduce yourself a little bit and what you're doing at Google? Sure, thanks, Eric. So as you mentioned, I, uh, I lead a team at Google. What we work on is uh, tools for internal developers to build full stack apps. Um, and part of that um, is that we help guide the API guidelines for internal development specifically. So there's a team that manages API creation. And since we create backends and front ends that communicate over APIs, we want to make sure that they meet the needs of internal users where the producers and the consumers of the API are both internal, uh, which is has slightly different requirements than our public APIs. So we want to make sure that these are met. So our team uh, works closely with the API guidelines team in order to make sure that uh, you know they address the needs of our team. Personally, I, I ran into the Google guidelines quite a while ago. Um, uh, they're, they're officially called API improvement proposals, right? Is that the official name of the guidelines? Yeah, they're API improvement proposals, AIPs for short. Yeah, that, 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 that is a little confusing, the AIPs for APIs, but whatever. Um, and there's something that's kind of special around those, which I really like, which is kind of the improvement part. So can you talk a little bit about that aspect of the, the Google guidelines? Yeah, sure. I think the, the guidelines are, are, again, meant to be a guideline. They're not necessarily meant to be like very rigid requirements. So the way they're written is... They are very, very specific in order to make sure that you follow rules, but they're flexible in that we do allow iterations, and that's part of what our team does. We iterate over the guidelines to improve them over time with newer versions coming out um, and taking input and adding more rules for different kinds of scenarios. Um, and the guidelines themselves have guidelines on how to evolve them over time, which really helps uh, make sure that it really needs the meets the needs of all the teams at Google since it's a very large organization and it's extremely varied. Yeah, that, that was the part that I really liked. You know, it's their, their guidelines for the guidelines, which I think is really smart because in a lot of organizations, I think the guidelines, somebody writes them and then they kind of just are there and they 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 don't really evolve alongside with, with practices. And um, so... In, in your professional life that you that you do, like how much of the work that you do is applying guidelines and how much is at least considering improving them or actually working on improving them? Um, I think mostly we we really we use the guidelines, but actually we help others use the guidelines. So a lot of what we do is building tooling around the guidelines to make sure the tools work. And I think that's really important because if you just have these guidelines and they're pages and pages long and very detailed, they're very hard to read and understand as a human, but they're actually really easy to implement for machines. So one of the things that goes hand in hand with the guidelines is the API linter. So that right away, when you write your new API, you just run the linter and it tells you what's wrong. Um, I don't think the guidelines would be basically usable without this level of tooling because they're, you know, they're very, very broad. Um, the tooling that my team works on is once you have an API that follows the guidelines, it's actually really easy to write something that generates code for it. So we generate code for backends and front ends to kind of get you bootstrapped and started. Um, and because you're following the guidelines, we know what your intent is when you write them. Um, we can we can bootstrap a lot more code for you. So we generally tend to keep up with the guidelines and make sure they're, you know, they make sense and they stay stable. Um, but we also give suggestions if we find that they're not meeting the needs for our clients. So if we have teams saying, well, these guidelines don't work for us because this and this doesn't work in your generated code, we can then go back and talk to the guidelines team and ask them for changes to evolve them going forward. So a lot of times we're really acting as liaisons between the users of our tools, which are many teams, and the guidelines uh, team. So that's usually around 10% of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, whenever you talk about stuff at Google, I think the the standard thing to say is that, well, most of the organizations out there are not Google. So, um, of course, right, it's what, what you're doing and the scale of what you're doing. And I would say the maturity of what you're doing is very sophisticated, but probably not so many organizations would go quite that far. 
But what I'm wondering is like, if you look at what you're doing and you had to help somebody, let's say in a smaller organization that isn't quite at the scale and sophistication of Google, and, and they're saying, well, that sounds like a good idea. Like, how should we get started? So would you have any ideas, you know, what, what would you recommend where people start when they want to, to start their guidelines journey? Um, sure. I mean, I think it makes sense to look at what's out there. So the Google AIPs are publicly available and the tooling around them, like the API linter is also publicly available. Um, because it's Google, we use Protobuf for basically everything because we use gRPC with Protobuf. That may not work for others, but the idea of how the guidelines, guidelines are written um, would be a good thing to look at. I think people generally start with the most basic um, you know, cruddle actions as the thing to start with that is the most useful for, um, you know, like resource specific guidelines. Um, and then again, I think I would emphasize that you should pick a small number of guidelines that make sense for your org and then build out the tooling. It's not that hard to build, but guidelines without tooling and an enforcement mechanism are probably not going to be so useful. If When I first read the guidelines, they told us like, okay, you could be an API reviewer. Now you you know, when an API is written, apply these rules. And it was very overwhelming because there's a lot of rules. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I can. But then I saw that there's like a linter and then between the linter and my understanding of the rules, I actually can help others um, develop their their APIs. And that made it a lot easier. So I would, I would very much focus on the tooling around the guidelines as something that you really require to get started. Yeah, that's a good point. So would you go as far as, and, and say that if, if you cannot provide tooling for guidelines, maybe you should consider not creating them? Or is that a little bit too, too I strict? A, I think it's a little too strict personally, because some of, the, some of the benefit of the guidelines is to force you to think about things you may not have thought about before. So for, you know, like as an example, you can look at list. If you were just write a list request, you'd be like, what do you need? You know, here's the resources I want, list them. And you may forget that, oh, actually you need pagination because, you know, your clients may eventually need pagination if you have too many objects. If you didn't think about that in the first place and you already published your API, you basically won't be able to change it. APIs because their contracts with clients that you have no control over are very rigid, much more rigid than like a library. Um, so... If you get them wrong, the cost is very high. So even not having the linter, just having the developers, especially developers that have never written an API before, have something to look at, I think already provides value. But um, if you want it, you know, I think for, for providing developers something to look at, that's great. If you're very concerned about having everything look the same and really have standards like coding standards and API standards, then you really want to do tooling because forcing people to kind of read it all by hand is not really going to scale. Okay. So yeah, I like that. So, so guidelines basically is as a list of things that people should consider or take into consideration and then tooling when it comes to actually make it easier for them to follow that. So if, if people want to kind of discover a little bit more about that. Are there any resources that we could point to? Of course, we will point to the AIP webpage. The linter is, like you said, open source. We will point to that. Is there any other stuff out there that you could recommend? Uh, sure. So there was a new paper published that really describes how the guidelines work within Google, and it's very accurate. It was called the API Governance at Scale. Um, and if you want to kind of understand the theory behind the guidelines and like why they're there and necessary, I actually really liked um, the book called, I have it here, API Design Patterns. Um, I thought it was a really good book and it really explained why it's necessary and what some basic guidelines would be. Yeah, I, I really like that book too. It, it came out pretty, well, about a year ago, I think, but it, it does have some of the things that you talked about, right? Like, like the pagin pagination stuff and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything that, that, you know, we should have covered that we maybe forgot, Esther? Um, yeah, I think one thing that we should, you should think about when you're writing the guidelines that I found useful is, um, when you write the guidelines, you should also tell people, give people examples and also explain why it's a lot easier to convince people, um, to follow a guideline when they understand why it's important. So I found, um, explaining to people why they should and why these specific guidelines make sense is a lot easier to get buy-in from people to actually do, um, you know, to actually follow these guidelines and it makes sense to people rather than just trying to like dictate company wide, you know, 
that you, and force people to do stuff because the guidelines and so you should really explain that to people so that would be part of the guidelines for guidelines right for each guideline it should say why why does it exist and i think that's that's a very valid point yes so yeah thank you very much for joining esther i think this is really interesting and Whenever I ask people about guidelines, a lot of people think they're useful, but still a lot of people are considering maybe creating them, but not quite there. So I think your experience there is definitely very helpful. All right. Thank you, Eric, for having me. I really appreciate you talking to me today. Thanks a lot for joining, Esther, and thanks everybody for listening in. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. And with this, we're done. And until next time, keep getting APIs to work. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.